Hello everyone. Thank you Vishen and Man Valley for giving me this stage to share our story. Today I'm standing here because of a promise made between two strangers. 46 years ago, I was born I'm a daughter of a single mother. And when I was 2 years old, my mother was jobless and she was struggling very badly. And this is when she met a stranger, Christina, a poor refugee woman from Angola, living in Portugal. She was a widow. She was totally illiterate. She had six kids of her own, and she worked as a cleaner to support them. When she met my mother and saw her struggling, she didn't blink her eye, and she offered help. She told my mom to go to the city, six hours away from the little village, to find herself a job, and she would take care of me until she came. So my mother left to Lisbon, and she never came back. So I became the seventh child of Christina. Christina was the only black family in that area, and those days it was totally inconceivable the idea of a black woman to adopt a white child. She struggled severely to convince the social services that they wanted to take me away from her and put me in an orphanage. She used to say, who feeds six, feeds seven. Seven years later, when I was nine, Christina suddenly passed away of a heart attack. I didn't understand that she had died, so I just thought she had gone to Lisbon to find my mother. And I waited and I waited and waited for Christina to come. When I was 12, I had to stop going to school. I was doing grade five. And from that point onwards, I was told that the only thing I could expect to achieve in life was to be a cleaner like Christina. So when I was 18, I left Portugal, and I told myself, if the only thing I'm going to achieve in life is to be a cleaner, I am not just going to be a cleaner, I'm going to be the Ronaldo of the cleaning world. <laughs> so I left Portugal and I went to Switzerland, where the best cleaning in the world's jobs they were. I learned how to speak French, and I was cleaning. And when you're a cleaner those days in Switzerland, when you are a cleaner living in a minimum wages, they don't give you a visa. Three years later, going home from, uh, from work, I was hit and run by a car, and I woke up in the hospital with the police investigating the accident. They found out I was leaving illegally, and they asked me very politely to, they gave me 30 days to recover from my injuries and to ex exit the country. I was devastated, but I thought I'm Ronaldo of the cleaning world, I can start my life in a new country, and I left to England. I learned how to speak, in I, I learned how to speak English from the scratch. I was washing dishes in a restaurant. I was cleaning toilets. Sometimes I had three jobs, one during the day, one part-time at night, and one part-time on a weekend just to pay my bills. Three years later, always looking for better opportunities, I went to the job center. And they told me Emirates Airlines was recruiting cabin crew. I went on Google and researched how to pass the job interview. And I didn't fit the criteria. First, it doesn't look like, but I'm very small. High heels. <laughs> And I didn't have the education. You have to have a secondary education to, be work, to work as a cabin crew. I went for the job interview, and I just thought, if I go to this job interview, I'm not going to go as I'm looking for a job. I'm going to go as I am already a flight attendant. I went to Benetton. I bought a, a suit the same color as a flight attendant. I did the makeup, and I went for the job interview. That day, there was 100 candidates. 100, and only two of, and they asked me why there is 100 candidates here, why should we give you the job? What makes you so special than any other cabin crew, uh, other candidate? I told them, if you recruit me, you are recruiting the best, the Ronaldo of the cleaning world. <laughs> <laughs> so they gave me, and I couldn't believe only two of us, they got the job. 
So, 2003, I moved to Dubai, and I really felt like I had won the lottery. I couldn't believe I was flying for, to Seychelles, Mauritius, Maldives, and I was staying in five-star hotels. It was incredible. Shortly after, I was recruited to work as a VIP flight attendant to the royal family in UAE. So I thought I, we, I hit jackpot twice again in a lifetime. <laughs> so I was flying undercover to royal family all around the world, staying in the most amazing places. And three years later, I was asked to do a 24-hour layover in Bangladesh, one of the third world, third world countries. You know, when I got to Bangladesh, I always thought I came from a very, very, very humble background. Christina lived on food stamps. She had a tab at the grocery shop. She didn't know how to feed the kids. But when I went to Dhaka, I, saw, I understood what was the meaning of poverty. And I thanked God for everything I had and didn't have. So what I ended up doing, I ended up doing exactly what Christina had done to my mothers. I ended up promising the struggling families in the slums of Dhaka that I was going to take care of their children until they finished their education. I started to swap all my flights, my Seychelles, Mauritians, Maldives, New Yorks, Milans, and I started to go to Dhaka. I started by helping 39 children. Soon it became 98 kids then 200, and then 600. I'm going to be honest with you, I had no idea how to help these kids. But I opened a daycare center, a preschool, primary school, secondary school, first aid center, computer training, a computer training center, a dental center. I didn't know how to do any of those. But I found people, experts, I would go, Puri, you're a teacher. I have a school. Teach me how to run this school A to Z. Puri, teach me how to recruit a teacher to teach my kids. Someone would do the draft, put an advert on a newspaper, and we recruit. So I learned everything A to Z. It was not me. People, they taught me how to do it. So I had all, and then I was still flying as a cabin crew, and I had this beauty, my, my goal and my vision from day one in 2005 was one day my children, they're gonna grow up, they're gonna leave this slum community, they're gonna go abroad, they're gonna go to universities, they're gonna go, go work in amazing companies. People, they thought I was crazy, totally crazy. Because when these kids, they, these kids when I met them, they didn't have, even had a birth certificate. Their mothers, they never had gone to school. They didn't know how to read and write. People, they thought I was being cruel to give hope, to, to tell these kids from the slums of Bangladesh to teach that one day they would come out of the slums. It was not done. But I believed in my vision. For the first three years, I never had to ask for money. People, they knew who I was, cabin crew, they were helping me, the pilots, they were helping me, passengers of the airline, they were helping me. People, they were giving me clothes, shoes, toys, books, diapers, milk, formulas. I was asking the cabin crew to carry these items over. If you were flying first class, I would meet you two hours before the airport without knowing who you were and asking you, are you going to Dhaka? Do you have extra allowance? Can you take my things? Are you flying business class? You have extra allowance? Can you take 20 kilos for me? Can you take 10 kilos for me? And this is how I was doing things. Three years later, 600 kids, recession came, the global recession in 2008. And overnight, I started to lose one by one all my, spons all my sponsors. They were vanishing. So we started to cut down costs and expenses. And I was really desperate at the time to find investors, because in the slums of Bangladesh, when you don't put the food on the table of a child or the roof over the head of that child, that child is going to be forced to get married at the age of 10, 11, 12, with someone three, two to three times her age. So I went, this is where I met my best friend, Google. <laughs> so I typed, 
Google, what is the quickest and most efficient way to find investors, to make money, to pay the cost of these kids? And Google said, if you know someone famous, like Angelina Jolie, Ronaldo, and they become the ambassadors of your organization, you will get the money. I wrote letters to many famous people. I kept researching and Google said, if you go on a popular TV show, you will reach a wider audience and they will know what you're doing. So I wrote letters. And then I came across an uh, interesting article that it said there was a team from England of athletes going to the North Pole. They had raised one million pounds and they were hoping by reaching the North Pole they were gonna raise two million pounds. Wouldn't you go to North Pole to raise two million pounds? So I thought, oh my God, I have no idea where is the North Pole, <laughs> what I have to do to get there. And remember, I didn't finish school. But to get these two million pounds, to keep the kids in school, I'm gonna get there. The next expedition available was in four months. So I, I Google on the internet, and I never had done sports in my life up to that point. Unless you consider going from the galley to the cabin, asking you, would you like chicken? <laughs> would you like beef? Tea? Coffee? <laughs> but I thought, an athlete is not an athlete when he's born. What do I have to do to transform myself into an athlete? I found myself a personal trainer coach online, and I asked him, Ismael, did you watch Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> me, Panda, we have four months to get to the North Pole. <laughs> Train me. <laughs> four months later, I became the first Portuguese woman to get to the North Pole. There was no million pounds, there was no million pounds. However, I was asked to do a speaking event in a graduation party in a school, and I was offered a scholarship for five students from Bangladesh to come to Dubai, all expenses paid until they finished their education. So that completely changed the life of that five kids. But remember, I still have 595 in Dhaka. Angelina Jolie still didn't answer. Ronaldo moved to a new club. <laughs> Oprah, Ellen didn't respond. I went back to Google. Google, what can I do to get the money? And Google said, <laughs> did you know the first Jordanian man that climbed the Everest erased 4.8 million dollars? So I thought, if the only thing I have to do to get to the North Pole, I mean to get to the Everest, to get the money, to keep the kids in school. And remember, at that stage, we were sinking. We were like Titanic with holes, and we were sinking. So I decided to climb Everest. And I couldn't believe in 2012, no Portuguese woman had climbed Everest. So I thought, this is going to be huge. I'm going to make so much money. So I signed up for an expedition to the Everest. I found myself, I, I just thought, what does a climber has to do to become a climber? He has a trainer. I found Satya Bratadam, 35 years of experience in climbing. And Satya had a dream. I told him about the Kung Fu story, but he watched A Million Dollar Babe. His dream was to find the most incapable, men or female and coach that person and transform her or him into a world-class climber and put it at the top of Everest and back down. So when I, when I got my email, it was, dream come true. <laughs> I start, Satya told me, in two years, I can transform you into a world-class climber, mountaineer. I told him, Satya, the children of Dhaka, they cannot wait two years. It's too late. This, this has to be done in one year. We are sinking and fast. We started potentially one of the hardest years of my life. I was training six hours a day. I was, <laughs> I was going on a, on a, 
on a beach pulling tires with 30 kilos backpack. I was climbing to the tallest towers in, in Dubai, four hours with 30 kilos, up and down, up and down. Meanwhile, I had so many financial problems in Dhaka, and I made an, an, an announcement that I was gonna climb Everest. What do you think it was the reaction of Portugal? Up to that point, only two Portuguese citizens, they had climbed Everest. I if I made it, I would be the first Portuguese woman. What do you think it was the reaction of Portugal? Portugal said, what are you doing? You're gonna bring so much shame into our country. You are not a climber. If anyone dies in Everest this year, it's because you kept uh, a, a traffic line. Anyway, I stopped and I was deaf and I kept training. One year later, on the 21st of May, 2000, 13, I became the first Portuguese woman to climb Everest. <laughs> all I could think was, when I was at the summit, was all the things I was gonna do with my million dollars. When I was at the top of Everest, people, they asked me, how did it felt? Was it like, yeah, I'm here at the top of Everest, I made it? No. My Satya Bratadam got really sick with altitude sickness, and my Sherpa, they were sick. I was 45 minutes at the top of Everest with my oxygen bottle running low. I had no idea where Satya and my guide they were. I didn't know if they had come down or if I was up. And I was there standing in Everest, seeing all the other climbers that had made it, calling their family members and loved ones to tell that they had made it to the top of Everest. And my phone had frozen. I couldn't call anybody to say I had made it. Anyway, 45 minutes later, Satya made it. We took the beautiful shot, and I came back down. And all I could think was all the things I was going to do. When I came back down, there was no million dollars. After all, there was nothing, not even publicity. After all, in a world saturated of news, becoming the first Portuguese woman was nothing. What happened? We had to send 600 kids back to the streets. The parents of the kids, they were working in our organizations, they became unemployed. Very shortly after, I lost my job. I lo and when you live in Dubai, like me, I lost my residence visa. And I thought I'm gonna pretty much going to become homeless. I contacted the ex-boyfriend I had not spoken to in five years, and I asked him to help me paying to rent and, to and put food on a table. And I started to wonder, where did I go wrong? All these people, they are raising the money, and I didn't. So I just thought, maybe I'm destined to do better things. So I went back to Google, and I Googled, how can I, get men how can I get the money? And Google said, marathons was very, someone actually told me, why don't you do something that appeals to the whole world? If you, want to do some, if you want to raise that amount of money, you have to do something that gets the attention of the whole world. So I started running marathons, okay? <laughs> Someone suggested, why don't you run seven marathons in the seven continents in the shortest time possible? So I contacted Nike, and I told them, I want to, do I want to start running marathons, and I want to do seven marathons in seven continents in the shortest time possible. Nike started training me, and three weeks later, they dropped me. See, Panda, <laughs> everyone says when you climb Everest, you come back 10 kilos lighter. I came back 10 kilos heavier. So when I started training, I was always, I was registering in races in Dubai. I was going to do 5K, 10K, and I was always the last one to reach the finish line. Sometimes there was not even finish line. But then I started to say, okay, today I'm gonna run 
one, one kilometer, then I'm gonna run 2K, I'm gonna walk, jog. Then my goal was I'm gonna get on, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be the second last. And then I started to think, okay, I'm so slow, just think there is a lion or a crocodile behind you. <laughs> but to cut short, one year later, I not only finished the seven marathons in the seven continents, I broke two Guinness World Records. <laughs> In 2015, I decided to be more ambitious. I, I did seven marathons, seven continents in six weeks, so we thought, let's do it in seven days. People, they thought I was crazy, that I would need a private plane or a private aircraft to, to do the seven marathons in seven days in seven continents. I did it all flying commercial, all flying in <laughs> economy class. We've done seven mar six marathons in six continents in six days. Unfortunately, I couldn't finish in seven days because when I was supposed to land in Antarctica, there was a big storm and we had to divert back to Chile and wait for the weather to, cle to clear, but I still broke two more Guinness World Records. By the... <laughs> what do you think it was the reaction of the press? I contacted the press to tell them I had broken another two Guinness World Records. They told me, marathons, even a 75-year-old can run a marathon. What is so special? So they didn't write about the story. Can you do something new? Can you try something new? So I went back to Google and I typed, <laughs> and Google said, if you swim from England to France, That is the equivalent of the climbing Everest in a swimming world. So I thought, this is different, the press is going to love this, and I signed up to swim across the English Channel. When you try to swim across the English Channel, there is three things you have to do. Number one, you have to sign up with the Channel Swimming Association to get the license to swim across the English Channel. Two, you have to get, hire a pilot a pi to, to show you the way. And then you have to have a medical certificate showing that you're fit to swim across the English Channel. So the doctor thought, oh, you did the Everest, you did all these marathons, you're more than fit to swim across the English Channel. And then I had to start training. And I couldn't start training because of... There was a tiny little problem. I didn't know how to swim. <laughs> so I just thought, a swimmer is not a swimmer when he was born. What does a swimmer has to do to learn how to swim? He gets a swimming coach. I found Kevin Millerick, and I told him, Kevin, I have to swim across the English Channel in one year. My boat is sinking. Teach me how to swim. And Kevin told me, Maria, I am a pool swimming instructor. I do not know anything about swimming the English Channel. I told him, Kevin, the only thing you have to do is to teach me how not to drown when I'm swimming across the English Channel. <laughs> so Kevin teach me how to float first, <laughs> how to do my first 25 meters, the 25 meters became 50 meters, 75 meters, one kilometer, two kilometers, and swimming the English Channel is 34 kilometers. Then I was ready to start swimming in the open ocean. So I started to register for small races, you know, 400 meters on the ocean, 800. And my lovely children would come to support me on a weekend, you know, to be my sheer leaders. The first race I did, my kids, they were there with my boyfriend. And we was a lot of swimmers doing the first race. And my boyfriend said, look, there goes Maria. And Shuli said, there is so many swimmers. How do you know it's Maria? Because this is the only swimmer that is going the wrong, loca uh, lo wrong direction. <laughs> the you have to swim that way, and I was going to go to the wrong location. <laughs> anyway, I made it. I learned how to swim open water my first, first kilometer, two kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. And one year later, I announced 
that I was gonna attempt to swim across the English Channel. So on the 31st August 2016, I attempted to become the first Portuguese woman to swim across the English Channel. Just before I left for my swim, I got a message, you know, when you wake up, the first thing you do, you check your emails. I, read, uh, I got an email from the schools in Bangladesh saying I was $200,000, $200,000 in debt. And if I didn't pay the $200,000, they would sue me and I would have had a court case. So it was very important that I would swim across the English Channel. So I went and I swam for seven hours. I swam 15 kilometers the right, location, uh, the right <laughs> direction this time. Seven hours later, suddenly the weather changed to, and uh, there was too many currents and the pilot decided to abort the swim. Two days earlier, someone had, one kilometer away from getting to France had passed away and they didn't want to take the risk. So they aborted to swim. And I just thought, how can I go home now and tell these children, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the money. You have to go back to the streets a second time. I cried like I had lost everything. Then I just thought, you know, I have to roll up the sle sleeves, and I have a court case coming against me, I have to find a new solution. So I went to the internet, and I couldn't believe that morning on my social media, I, only, I had only 500 followers, 500. And those seven hours that I was swimming for 15 kilometers, my, I, I had 12,000 followers. 12,000 in seven hours. And these followers, they were, these people, they were sending messages to my boyfriend at the boat and saying, please tell her to stop, how to, to swim. I'm gonna give her the money she needs, but tell her to stop swimming. <laughs> okay. So these 12,000 people, they, they paid my debts actually. Finally, for the first time, How long do you think it took me to recover from the crisis in 2008? And what else did I have to do to put the food and the roof over the head of the children? January 8 Guinness World Records later, I finally managed to overcome the recession. I transformed myself into an athlete. I broke two Guinness World Records in 2007, 2017 by doing Ironmans, 
around, to, around the six continents in the shortest time possible. Then in 2018, I still didn't have made the money, so the journalists, they told me I had to do something different. So I was attempting to become the first Portuguese woman to climb the seven summits, the seven highest mountains around the seven continents. And on the process, I was doing my number six. And unfortunately, on the way down, I fell off, on the way down, coming down, I fell off the mountain and I got injured. And the doctors told me, this was it. My career as an athlete was over. And now what, the only thing I had was this body. How, if I couldn't be an athlete, I couldn't put food on the table, I couldn't put the roof over the head of the kids. So I told the doctor, don't tell me what I cannot do, tell me what I can do with this injury. <laughs> so, after a long time, we did a lot of physio, we, we went to do the surgery, I did a knee surgery in 220. The doctor told me I would never be able to run again. I could swim, I could cycle, but I could not run ever again. However, I did the knee surgery, I stayed six weeks in a bed, unable to walk. My children, they were taking me out of bed every morning. They were giving me shower, <laughs> I mean, helping me getting ready. I learned how to walk again, and then I signed up to do an Ironman again, and I wanted to break a Guinness World Record. <laughs> and the doctor said, but you cannot run. I said, doctor, don't worry. I will walk so fast, like I have a lion, a leopard, a, a crocodile, a, a shark uh, running after me. So in t t last year, I managed to break another Guinness World Record, my number nine. February 2022, 23, I managed to break another Guinness World Record. <laughs> I'm currently training for my number 11 Guinness World Record, and I'm hoping I'm training as well to climb, to become the first Portuguese woman to climb across, uh, no, to climb K2. People often ask me, what has been the hardest thing I ever done in my life? Or what was the hardest thing I saw, uh, until now? Was it losing my job? Was it nearly... Was it the North Pole? Was it the South Pole? Was it the marathons? Was the freaking cold English Channel? Was it the freaking cold South Pole, the Antarctica? The hardest thing I ever done in my life has been honoring a promise I made to 100, 100 mothers and families in Bangladesh that I was going to take them out of poverty. I never expected that helping someone would be so difficult in life. <laughs> and it's only now, 18 years later, that I started to see results of my work. The children, they are no longer children. They are uh, young adults. The children that people, they used to say they were going to be baby-making factories or they were going to work in uh, garments or they're going to be housewives. They are now in Europe, going to universities. Some of them, they are doing their, finishing their universities. We have, remember the kids, they were at the North, Pole, the North Pole, they finished their master's degree. I have taken out of the slums of Dhaka 122 kids. I brought them to Dubai, where I work, uh, where I live. 34 of them became the first generation students. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage. And this is our butterflies. <laughs> I think they would like to say a word. Hello, everyone. I'm Alamin, and I'm 24 years old. And I met with this alien. It was in 2005, when I was just six years old, kids. 
and I used to live in a slum, which was one of the biggest slums in Bangladesh. Suddenly, when I was just playing in the garbage, I saw a mysterious lady, and I never saw something like uh, that kind of lady in our area with brown hair, fairy skin, and speaking with alien language that I never heard before. And then I ran to her because she was giving food and I was so hungry. And then after seeing her, I was so curious. I was touching her hair, skin, and trying to listen what she's saying. After that, she met with my parents, my mom, and she made a promise to my mom that I want to give a better future to your kids and I want to take you from here to a better place where he can get a quality education, a better future. So my mom and my dad was the first family who believed on this alien. <laughs> and then we moved from to a slum to a better place. And then she, gave, uh, she admitted me in her school, giving food and everything that we need that time. So I completed my grade 12 from Bangladesh. And then I, currently I am living in Dubai and working uh, in a fashion company. And everything came to possible because of Mom Maria. And Thank you so much, my alien, for transforming me from a poor slam kid to a smart, ambitious, and handsome man too. Ah. <laughs> okay. You may be wondering why she, he's labeling us telling I'm an alien. Back in 2005, when I met this lovely family, uh, the children and their families, they thought that they lived in a slum of Bangladesh. They thought there was no other countries in the world, no other languages, no other humans, no other, nothing. They thought that small village where they live, it was the only place on earth. So when they first saw me, they thought, you know, first, I was the first white person they ever saw in their life. Yeah. <laughs> so they thought I was an alien and they were really scared of me. And the only reason they joined my organization was not because of education, the, because education was no existent at the time. It was only because they were hungry and I was giving them Food. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Hello everyone, I'm Aklima. Uh, currently, I'm doing my Bachelor in Chemical Engineering in Portugal. In, two in 2006, my father got separated from us and I saw my single mom suffering with four kids. And then in 2007, we met her, blessing for us. And she gave us all the basic needs we need and education, the most important thing. And with her help, we managed, I managed to complete my 12th grade and also my siblings, my two sisters and one brother. And in 2020, I went to Dubai with her help. And then I got internship in Chanel, luxurious fashion brand. And working in Chanel, I managed to get my visa for Portugal and I went to Europe. I went in Portugal and I'm studying. Currently I'm working, I'm studying and helping my families. All I'm doing only because of her. I'm very grateful for her, uh, having her in my life. And today, I'm a young, independent woman only because of her. Thank you, Mom. Hello, everyone. Tere. Uh, I'm Chadni. And my mother got married at the age of 11, and now I'm 17. I will be 17 on October. I'm not married, have no kids, <laughs> and I'm studying hard to have uh, my dream comes true. I, I want to be a dentist. <laughs> and <laughs> and my, I have an elder sister. She was the first one to join her project, and I was the second one. She's my younger sister, and my, 
my elder sister is doing her university in Europe, in Portugal, in her home country. And my mother, who didn't know how to read and write, she is working in Dubai in a good company. And me and my sister is studying in Dubai. Thank you so much, Mom. We are so grateful for your help. <laughs> Hello, I'm Shurji Moni. I'm 12 years old. When I was a kid, I was fully mute. I didn't talk to anyone. Now I'm, I, I'm the most talkative girl <laughs> in the class. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Because of Mom, love. <laughs> oh, sorry. So in 2005, I went to the slums of Dhaka and I made these children and their impoverished families I was going to change their life. But it has been them that they completely changed my life these last 18 years. I would have never been here. I was a bit like Shurja Muni. I'm an incredibly introvert. <laughs> Today, I, I promised them to change their life, but these them they who completely changed it completely changed my life. I would not be here standing in this stage without the help of my volunteers who taught me how to do things. I would like to call on stage Victoria and Catherine. So I'll, I met Catherine, I'll let her tell your story. <laughs> Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, I'm actually Estonian, so did it. Uh, <laughs> I uh, lived in Dubai, met Maria. I was looking for a job, actually. And uh, coming from this, um, the world of NGOs and fundraising, I thought that she really needed some help. And uh, I went to Dhaka a few times. I met these kids when they were very small. So um, I haven't seen them for seven years, so it's actually very surreal for me to see them here in Estonia. Um, but yeah, just um, if you think that uh, human, uh, humans or yourself, that you have limits, then uh, just think of Maria. And, um, <laughs> Well, if you don't have goosebumps or have teared up during the presentation, you're not human. <laughs> Sorry. I cry every time. And I've heard it quite a few times. But these kids are amazing. Um, well, Maria is 24-7. She hasn't had a break for 18 years. We all have holidays. We all take me time. She works 24 hours a day. She can be sending you a message at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know that. She can be panicking on a Sunday because a visa got rejected. It's non-stop. It's having 600 kids. We all have one, two, three. She has 10 here, 12 now. Uh, but she has 17 in Dubai, 122 going around the world, 600 to take care of. Can you imagine that? It's crazy. So she has not had a break. She relies on people like you, like us, to have a break, to get funds. She can get funds today, but this is a one million business dollar with no income. It's only expenses. So it really depends on you, people like you, to get this going. And she's done all this crazy stuff. Everything she's done is just for them. There's no ego, there's nothing related to her. It's just for them, this is purpose with capital letters. So she depends on us to do everything. So I'm just asking you from here because she would never, never ask. She's so humble, she would never say a word saying, please help me. She will do these crazy things, but she would not ask. So I'm going to ask because I do have that ability that she wouldn't do it. Please help her in any way or manner with your skills, with your contact, with whatever you have. Some of us, we're not rich, but we have our time, we have our skills, we have our you know, ability to do whatever we can do. Whether it's fixing a web page, whether it's contacting her with somebody, any help is a big step for us. So please, um, you have, this is the web page of Maria Concesao, where you have some part of it, and if you pass that one, 
that is uh, just given. Uh, there is a crowdfunding platform. So if you want to add even one euro, if each of you give one euro only, we could just buy a ticket for someone to come to Dubai just with one euro. So if you multiply that, imagine what we can do. So anything you can think of, you can come to us and also you know, offer your help. Whatever, whatever ideas, we're always welcome to any ideas. So thank you so much for being here, for listening to this beautiful story and for having these kids here. And please talk to them, talk to us. We're always happy to hear from you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, to, for listening to our crazy story. <laughs>